just saw a movie. We just saw a movie. That's right. We just saw Godzilla Tokyo SOS, which first time for you. Yes, 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 yes. And and such a neat follow up. To right. The previous movie that we saw, you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, which is what Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla. Yes. Right. But it's not just a follow up to that. That uh, this was also a follow up to well. The original Mothra. Yes, which is a favorite of mine because I love Mothra. She's, she's kind of my favorite of the kind. Really? Yeah. Okay. She's so soft and fuzzy and lovely, and she has good intentions. It's just, you know, people are idiots sometimes, so what are you going to do? So we talked about seeing Mothra at the Hollywood Theater in Portland mm-hmm. a few weeks ago on Monster Kid Radio, my monster movie podcast. Uh, where uh, I went to go see the movie with Beth, as well as with our friend Matt Rashley. And some of his family was there as well. And I had never seen Mothra on the big screen, so it was super cool to see on the big screen. And this movie, Godzilla Tokyo SOS, while it wasn't necessarily a first-time viewing for me, I didn't remember a lot of it. I didn't remember most of it. When I got into Godzilla movies, finally, uh, I binged them all watch them one after another after another and especially with the Heisei era and the Millennium era of films, a lot of them started to blend. I can tell you what happens in these movies but I can tell you which movie takes place before whatever movie and which other kaiju appear in this one versus this one versus this one. Space Godzilla is a big favorite of mine. He's from the, uh, the Heisei era. I really like Space Godzilla. Biollante is pretty darn cool too. But the Millennium ones especially, they all start to blend. And I think it's because the continuity isn't as strong Mm -hmm. as you have in the Showa or the Heisei era of films. I'm expecting that most of this is like, for you. No, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the different eras and stuff. So I'm 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 following generally a lot. But, you know, as much as you're saying the continuity isn't a strong one thing that I was just so pleased to see and, and in a way touched to see was that uh, actor Hiroshi Koizumi, who, of course, was in the original Mothra and was our, you know, our protagonist that was supposed to be the, the sub out for us as the viewer, was back in his yeah. role again. Now as a much older man with a grandson and, you know, children and stuff, but... I, so touching and, and so wonderful to see a, a classic actor like that have a modern uh, reincarnation of their same role and get to continue that on and, and get to still be working in the field so many years later. What I really loved about that, and we see this in like some of the Godzilla movies, not necessarily the same actor always coming back, but when Toho did the Heisei era, for example, they basically jettisoned all of the Showa era films. Mm. They said the first Godzilla movie was canon. The rest of it, whatever, we're just going to start with Godzilla 1985 or The Return of Godzilla and pick it back up from there and go from there. And when the Heisei era ended, they basically did the same thing again with the Millennium films that they jettisoned everything except the first Godzilla movie, which did get referenced kind of in this film. Well, it wasn't the only classic kaiju film or Toho film to reference because they ended up referencing the original Mothra as well. And I, I just liked having that that bit, that connective tissue to uh, one of the classic films. I didn't remember a lot of the specifics, but when the title appears on screen and you see Tokyo SOS, mm-hmm. most of it's in Japanese. I don't read Japanese. I did recognize with my oldest uh, daughter, Jin, speaking Japanese pretty fluently, I did uh, recognize the the sport East Capital, which is what Tokyo yep. is, it's East Kyoto. So well, East Capital uh, was there with an SOS, but the rest of it I Did you that. notice in the SOS, in the O, mm-hmm. was the Mothra symbol? Yes, I did yeah. catch that, and I, yeah. I really liked how that was brought back and used again. And I really enjoyed the Grand Peanuts, and that's what I'm calling them. <laughs> I'm calling them the Grand Peanuts, and the, the Peanuts themselves were one of my favorite parts of Mothra, and because of my daughter and, and her learning about Japanese culture and a lot of that, and, and of exchange student friend that I'd had in high school, um, I, I knew of the peanuts. them as a group separate from the movie, and so it was neat to have like Grand Peanuts 
representing that, you know, in, in this one. It is barely touched on that they're not the same fairies from Mothra. Right. We do see photos of the original fairies mm -hmm. when uh, Koizumi's character brings out some photos basically snaps a, from the first film. That was so lovely too, yeah. to have those touchstones and those connections. I felt that that really honored the original film. We are going to be joined by Wednesday here, oh. who uh, is not kaiju-sized, but maybe someday. Foreshadowing. <laughs> she has some strong opinions, but she'll let you know if she does. Anyway. Yeah, she's good. I had a blast with this. Uh, we saw it as part of a Fathom Offense screening at a local Regal Cinemas. That's you know, it. the one thing that I didn't enjoy about the show tonight, and it sounds after talking to the, to the guys working at the popcorn counter like this is not a unique experience, uh, the lights never fully went down in the theater we were in, and that definitely uh, inhibited some of my enjoyment of the movie, and it definitely let me see a lot more of the other patrons than I was interested in seeing. So. I'm pretty worried because we just saw another Regal close, you know, over by the Joy Cinema, which is one of our favorite right. cinemas here in Portland. Um, their, their nearby Regal closed, and, and we were at a Regal tonight, and I have a feeling it's on its way out as well by the lack of repairs in the building and the fact that they couldn't even turn the lights down all the way for the movie. Now, I'm assuming this is how it is all set up in the projection booth. In the past, the way digital projection works is it's all set up, not just starting and ending the movie, or starting and stopping the movie, but the lights are all programmed as well. And I'm assuming that their projector and their programming is all set up to where movie starts, lights are dim because there's a signal sent to the digital projection or whatever it is. I'm assuming, again, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that's kind of how it's set up. If that's the case, House 15 in that particular Regal Cinema, there's some lighting issues. I had a hard time getting completely 100% immersed in the film. I would say the same. But I still enjoyed the film oh, so much. very much so, very much so. It's a continuation of the Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla film as well. So the world has kind of moved on from the last Godzilla attack. They've lost track of Godzilla. They have Mechagodzilla, but he's still in disrepair. They need some big diamond to get that absolute zero weapon up and running, and they never really quite get there. I'm glad they kept mentioning that, though, so it wasn't like this lingering bit of, but wait a minute, what about in that last movie? They, they acknowledged all of it. The continuity was strong. And they give a good scientific reason for why it wasn't being prepared, you know? And yeah. even tied it into politics of, of the whole thing. Right. You know, in a way that made sense and was believable. The human characters from the previous film don't continue in this. It's a whole new cast of humans uh, interacting with Mechagodzilla and Godzilla and Mothra. Mm -hmm. And I do miss, like, the kind of sort of romance that was starting at the end of Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla, but well, we these characters a, were good, too. We got a new little romance yeah. uh, going on as a subplot in this one. Um, and, you know, and so that... That was kind of neat. I really enjoyed the young man who played the grandson. I think he did yes. an excellent job for somebody so young. Like, he was very believable and, and touching and had a very heartfelt performance. So. It was really solid work for all the way around. Even, you called him Japanese Top Gun. Even, <laughs> no, I said Japanese Tom Cruise, but Japanese same Tom, thing. Yeah, yeah, Japanese Tom Cruise. He's, well, they say at one point, you know, he's from the Top Gun Japan, Academy yes. or something along those lines. Even a character like that, who could have been painted with a very broad, arrogant jerk brush, ends up having a little bit of depth and maybe mm -hmm. even a little bit of a mini journey that he goes on. A little bit where he gets over the whole arrogance and understands what his role is and what he can do to kind of help save the day or at least save somebody. You know, one of... I, I loved that. And one of the other things I really loved in this one that I actually think was a little better than... Uh, well, I know we said it's not really the previous one, but the previous, you know, one that we saw. The scenery was even better in this one. Yeah. At one point they go out into kind of the countryside and, and the grandfather's villa and stuff, and they see all that, and it was this just gorgeous 
traditional log cabin type house. Everything inside was very traditional Japanese and, and you could see a lot of uh, the different cultural aspects that fed into that. And I felt like a lot of the other interior sets at, you know, military, or not military, but defense force right. headquarters uh, were more detailed and ha were more fleshed out and had just further extensions, they weren't as tight of shots in a lot of ways, you got a lot more, you got more side characters, things like that. And I, I really appreciated that that level of detail and that level of work in this in this film. I do like that almost all of it is all rubber suits again. Oh. Every once in a while you can tell that something was created in a computer somewhere, but most of it was all real destruction happening, mm -hmm. which I enjoyed a lot more in this. Uh, I just respond better to knowing there's a dude in a suit somewhere. <laughs> like the last one, like Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, they did show a short film. Uh, this time around, though, this short film, Godzilla vs. Gigan Rex, I'd never seen it before. It was produced in 2022, uh, and it didn't do much for me. It was all CG. And again, yeah. I, want, I want a dude in a suit. I mean, for for the action that took place in it, I, I see why they just went CG, and for it being a short, I yeah. guess. But I think you could have done a similarly good job with just a, some slight alterations in plot and done it with guys in suits and, right. and had it be just much more intense and, much, and feel a lot more real. Well, the last one had a short film, and it was dudes in suits. Mm -hmm. It just looks better. It feels better. It feels right for the franchise. Yeah, it feels more appropriate. And I, I know Legendary Godzilla movies, they're 100% CGI at this point. And that works for them. But for a classic Toho romp, and I say classic for a movie that came out in 2003, <laughs> for a classic Toho romp, I want to do it in a suit. 2003, we double-checked the date. Because this had something that is now so... Common, yeah. It's a trope now in, in American blockbusters, anyway. The post-credit sequence. Exactly. In fact, when, when the credits started, and a bunch of people just started getting up to leave, my brain automatically went, ugh, I hate it when people do that. Like, have they not been to a movie in the last 15, 20 years or whatever? But then I thought about it for a second, I went, oh, wait, this is an old movie. But then there was a yeah. post-credit uh, sequence, and uh, which hints at more destruction to come. I need to take a look at the filmography of Godzilla. I don't remember if the next one, the Toho release, continues this storyline, or if this just was kind of like the end of it. But yeah, for a movie that came out five years before Iron Man, and I know Iron Man is not the first movie to do a post-credit sequence. I was selling you in the car the first time I became aware of that was... Uh, with Lethal Weapon 3, which came out in the 90s. It used to be uh, a joke, actually, with me and my friends. We'd go to movies, and we'd stay through the end credits. And it was always, well, we want to see all the people who graduated film school. You know, th those are all the film nice. school graduates at the end. Now it's everybody who works in every overseas VFX house. But, <laughs> you know, uh, I, yeah, post-credit sequence, and as... I had forgotten about this. As they're showing what the images are on the screen, and they're kind of telling us what the various text means, mm -hmm. it's like, oh no, nobody learned their lesson. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Godzilla's going to come back, and it's going to be all of our fault and, again. And now we're genetically engineering them. Ah, yeah. yeah, great. So, you know, you, you mentioned a guy in a suit. That that does give me an idea. We could do a cosplay. You in a Godzilla suit. I could make a Mothra costume, and we'll get you a couple of little Barbie dolls, and I'll dress them up like the Peanuts, and it'd be perfectly sized, right? I thought you were going to say, <laughs> I should be in the Mothra suit, and you'd be one of the Peanuts, because you're wow. fun size, and I'm a giant dude. Wow! You know what? On that, I, I, I think maybe it's time to say goodnight. I, I, I think you're done for the night. <laughs> you could do the song. Mothra. Oh, that one? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for Derek and Beth, Team Death, uh, this has been Team Death Goes to the Movies. We went to the movies. We went to the movies. We went to the movies.